So this is Cinebench running on the new ViewBook S15 OLED. And the performance here is very impressive. The scores are comparable to the latest chips from Intel, AMD, and Apple. And the crazy thing is that this is powered by none of those. It's actually rocking the Snapdragon X Elite chip from Qualcomm, which begs the question, is Windows on ARM actually ready? So there's actually multiple variants of the Snapdragon X Elite. The one I have here is a 78100, but there are three other SKUs above this with a higher clock speed and higher overall TDP. The 78100 is a 12-core, 12 12-thread 12 chip that runs at 3.4 gigahertz. It has the Adreno X1 GPU, which is running on the Adreno 741 chipset. Rest of the specifications here are 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5X RAM that's running at 8448 megatransfers, super you know fast memory to be honest and one terabyte of nvme storage pci gen 4 and i want to talk about performance right away i ran a bunch of synthetic benchmarks so geekbench 6 cinebench 2024 and the blender benchmark and results are on your screen right now and the scores are very impressive comparable to some of the latest x86 chips released in the past few years as well as apple silicon but performance isn't the problem the biggest advantage of ARM over x86 is efficiency, giving you similar if not better performance while consuming less power and generating significantly less heat. And that's actually true here, but the biggest disadvantage of ARM right now is compatibility issues. So most of the apps, programs, and games can be divided into three categories. Number one is natively optimized for ARM. So apps that were specifically built for this architecture. Number two is works on ARM, but through emulation. So you can run traditional x86 apps on these machines, but through emulation and the performance isn't the best. And category number three is doesn't work at all. And most of the popular AAA titles fall into this category. And if you're curious about what works on ARM, there is an official website maintained by Qualcomm and Microsoft that's going to tell you what works and what doesn't. So if something is really important to you and you wanna find out if it's gonna work on ARM, you should check out that website. Now, synthetic benchmarks aside, what about real world performance? And the answer here is a little tricky. If you're running apps that are optimized for ARM, the performance is great. So for example, Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, the Microsoft Office Suite, all of that works great without any issues. But if you're going to run apps that are not optimized for ARM through emulation, the performance here is a little choppy. And while I was doing my video editing test, I used both Adobe Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve. I also found out that some of the Adobe apps are still not optimized for ARM and Premiere Pro is actually one of them. DaVinci Resolve recently came out of their beta and they seem to be more optimized. And I used the same 4K clip, a five minute project and rendered it in both the programs. And the difference here is huge. Premiere Pro takes about 11 minutes to render this project, whereas DaVinci Resolve does it in under four minutes. And it's not just the render times, even the overall video editing experience is significantly different. So playing back videos, scrubbing through the timeline, and just the overall responsiveness of the software is better in DaVinci Resolve. But when it comes to Premiere Pro, things were very shaky. If you use the Adobe apps to do serious work and you want a reliable machine, I would say hold off on the Snapdragon laptops for now. Wait for Adobe to launch a optimized for ARM version of their Creative Cloud suite and then performance should get better. Also, I wanted to mention that the performance difference between plugged in and on battery is not that much. Single core performance remains the same. Multi-core performance takes a little bit of a hit, maybe five to 10%, but overall performance on battery was great. So CPU performance is good, but I wish I could say the same about graphics. The GPU on the Snapdragon X1 Elite is mid. It's average to be honest, and it shows in real world performance as well as synthetic benchmarks. Qualcomm is claiming 3.8 teraflops of performance on the Adreno X1. It also does not have its own dedicated memory. So the onboard memory is shared by both the CPU and GPU. But the good news is that it has hardware encoding for codecs like AV1 and H.264. And for basic stuff, it's fine. Like if you're watching videos, you know, doing normal stuff, editing videos, light photo editing, all of that is fine. But when you start pushing this GPU with higher end tasks, like playing back 4K raw video, I even tried playing back 8K raw video from the Canon R5 in DaVinci Resolve, there it starts struggling. So playback is choppy, it's not able to cut it. And that's to be expected since this is the entry level of the spectrum, 
But in general, I think Qualcomm needs to improve the GPU aspect of their ARM chips. Now, since I mentioned GPU, a bunch of you guys are curious about gaming. Now, gaming on ARM is a whole different story. You can divide the games in the three categories which I mentioned earlier, um, which is optimized and made for ARM. Those games, nobody really wants to play. Uh, run through emulation, some games will work from x86 you know, systems. And then there's the third category, don't work at all. And most of our popular AAA titles, most of our popular esports titles are in this category. I did try gaming. I was able to run GTA 5 on 1080p, low to medium settings. I was able to get a playable, you know, 45 to 55 FPS, sometimes even 60. So GTA 5 is playable, but that's like a really old game now. I was also able to boot up Counter-Strike 2. Uh, I was able to get into a server through Steam. Now, the frame rate here was hilariously bad. Valorant wouldn't even boot because Riot's Vanguard anti-cheat has some problems running on ARM. So I would say keep an eye on the website, which I linked down below, see which games work. And if you happen to have an ARM laptop yourself, you can try some you know, games out and update on the website if they work. Now, talking about efficiency, how is the battery life and thermal performance of the Snapdragon X Elite? In my opinion, battery life was really solid. I was able to get, you know, 13 to 14 hours of battery life with light use. So that is email, browsing, office work, watching videos, playing some light games, some light editing. And if you're going to, you know, put some heavy tasks on this machine, like video editing and gaming, then you are going to get slightly less battery life. So 10 to 12 hours, again, really good. Now, talking about charging, this laptop actually has fast charging via the USB Type-C port, so it can go from 0 to 60% in about 49 minutes, which is pretty decent for a laptop. It's a 6000 mAh battery or 70 watt hours. And talking about thermal performance, I think this laptop has really solid thermals. The cooling design is really well done, but again, there is a twist here. If you're running, again, ARM optimized, you know, made for ARM apps, the thermals are really good, but if you're trying to push this laptop with x86 emulation or apps that are not optimized, it tends to heat up. Now, in terms of numbers, the laptop idles at about 38 to 39 degrees Celsius. Under load, for example, while editing a video in DaVinci Resolve or running Cinebench multi-core benchmark, it's around 65 to 70 degrees Celsius. And the max temperature I saw on the Snapdragon X Elite during my stress test was 94 degrees. Now, you're not gonna have that kind of temperatures on a daily basis, but yeah, those are the thermals. Now, if you're just doing you know, basic stuff like single core tasks, the CPU does not heat up. It barely goes above 55, 60 degrees, and the fan only spins when the CPU gets really hot, which is not you know, very often. So if you're running optimized apps, you're doing office work, you're doing you know, basic stuff, it stays pretty cool. So that was about the Snapdragon X Elite chip. Let's talk about the laptop itself, the ViewBook S15 OLED. In terms of design and build quality, I really like this. It's got that, you know, nostalgic MacBook Air sort of wedge design. It's really thin, under 1.5 centimeters, and it's also very light, 1.43 kilograms. And if you include the power adapter, that's another 400 grams. And it's a full metal build, so the laptop feels really solid in the hand. It's also got a really nice hinge, so the tension is just right, not too tight, not too loose. And it's also got their 180 degree flat lay hinge. So you can push the display all the way down. And in terms of just overall look and feel, I really like this color, gives the laptop a very premium you know, look. And overall design and build quality, in my opinion, is actually pretty good. The display has really thin you know, side bezels. The chin is a little big, but again, you need to have your display driver somewhere. And in terms of the build quality on the display assembly, there is little flex and there is little to no flex on the top lid. The bottom lid also feels really solid. And something very surprising is that the keyboard deck on this laptop is also very sturdy. So in terms of build quality overall, I like this. And this laptop also has the latest Wi-Fi 7 technology as well as Bluetooth 5.4. So you should be able to get the fastest Wi-Fi speeds on this laptop, which is a good thing since you're gonna be using this for work. And if you're a student, internet connectivity is very crucial. And you also have a webcam with a privacy shutter here. So this is a two megapixel full HD webcam. It also supports IR. So this you know, laptop has Windows Hello. And a physical shutter means that if you're not using the webcam, you can just close it. 
In terms of ports, there is actually very decent IO here. So you've got two USB type A ports, two USB four type C ports. These support display output as well as fast charging and really fast data transfers. You've also got a HDMI 2.1, a micro SD card reader. I would have appreciated a full size SD card reader for the content creators and creative professionals. And there is a headphone jack. So that's the port situation. In terms of thermal design, this is very similar to your you know, average Asus laptop. So you have your intake right here and you have your exhaust on the back. So nothing really special there. And overall, the ports in my opinion are pretty good. For a laptop of this caliber, you've got decent IO. Now talking about the inside, the keyboard and trackpad experience, the keyboard is a full-size keyboard with a numpad, but the keys on the numpad are significantly smaller compared to the rest of the keys. It's also a full RGB keyboard, so you can change the color and have some effects and stuff through Windows, which is nice. Now, the backlight is you know, not that uniform. It sometimes leaks around certain keys, so that's that. There is a function row on top, so you've got your regular function row from F1 to F12, but there are also some media controls and quick shortcuts. This laptop is also a Copilot Plus PC. This is actually Asus's first Copilot Plus PC, so there is a dedicated Copilot button. You can use that for AI-related stuff. You can use it to you know, assist with your everyday tasks. And there is also a dedicated NPU on this laptop for handling those AI-accelerated tasks. For example, the webcam. The webcam has those blur effects, the studio effects that are all handled by the NPU. So this is a webcam test of the ASUS Zeobook S15. It's got a 2 megapixel full HD camera with IR and a privacy shutter. So this is how the video quality is. You're also listening to the internal microphones, which has got AI noise cancellation. You guys let me know in the comments down below what do you think about the audio and video quality. It's also got you know basic features like background blur so you can have a portrait blur as well as a standard. There is automatic framing, there is some background noise going on so that should be a good judge. There is portrait light here and eye contact so these are some of the features and that's the webcam test. Now coming back to the keyboard and trackpad, the feedback and Travel here is pretty decent on the keys. I you know, enjoy typing on this laptop. The trackpad is a good size for a 15 inch laptop. This is a very big trackpad. It has physical clicks, which are actually silent, which is what I prefer. And it supports all the gestures. It's very accurate, very precise. I personally had no issues with the trackpad itself. Now, talking about the speakers on this laptop, audio on this laptop is tuned by Harman Kardon. So you've got stereo speakers. In terms of quality on those speakers, it does get plenty loud, like for a laptop, you can easily fill a room by yourself. And if you're watching a movie or listening to music alone, you should be fine. But the speakers do lack bass and also clarity isn't the best when you're, you know, at max volume. So there is a slight distortion, but yeah, vocals and everything is very clear. For doing, you know, fun stuff, these speakers are fine, but for any serious work, I would suggest headphones or external audio. And one of the highlights of the VivoBook S15 OLED is that display. It's a 15.6 inch ASUS Lumina OLED panel with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, 120 hertz refresh rate, 3K resolution, and this has 600 nits of peak brightness, supports HDR. It's also covering 100% of the DCI-P3 color gamut. It's a glossy panel, so you'll have to deal with reflections, but overall, the bezels around the display are thin enough for it to be an immersive experience. And the quality is really good. It's an OLED panel, so you get deep blacks, that high contrast look. It's sharp, gets plenty bright for indoor as well as usage in areas where there is, you know, really bright lighting. I wouldn't suggest using this outdoors, but yeah, visibility is great. You have more brightness than you will need on an everyday basis. And quality was great since it's a 120 hertz refresh rate. Everything is very smooth. So watching videos, doing creative work, if you're doing color sensitive work, this panel is great for that as well. So photo editing and video editing. 
And if you play some games or watch a lot of movies on Netflix or Amazon Prime, you're gonna have a good experience. And there you have it. Those are my two cents on the VivoBook S15 OLED powered by the Snapdragon XLE chip. Uh, the laptop retails for around $1,300 in the US. For that price, the laptop itself is not bad. It's just the compatibility issues on ARM that you need to think about. Like, are all the apps and games that you need compatible with ARM right now? If not, you can wait. The laptop is not bad. It's just that the optimization for certain apps needs to happen for this, you know, to become mainstream. But overall, I like the laptop. I like where Windows on ARM is headed. It's headed in the right direction. We're getting really nice battery life good performance, good thermals, and I'll drop links in the description down below so you guys can check the latest pricing. And if you wanna learn more, head over to the description down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one.